Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy for the date 8th of December 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles we will be going through today. Now without wasting time, let's get into the discussion. Look at this news article. This news article mentions that the Tamil Nadu government is going to increase its capital expenditure or capex in 3 years. Currently, the capital expenditure of Tamil Nadu is 25,000 crore per year. It will be increased threefold to 90,000 or 95,000 crore per year in three years' time. Well, this seems to be a right move, right? But why? For this, we need to understand what is capital expenditure. Capital expenditure forms an important part of the budget. Basically, the budget has two components which is receipts and expenditure. Here, receipts show the amount of money government has received or generated. On the other hand, the expenditure part shows how the generated money will be spent for the growth of the economy. Our focus today is on the expenditure only, that is public expenditure. It can be classified into two types. One is the revenue expenditure and the other is the capital expenditure. The revenue expenditure is the expenditure incurred by the government to meet its day-to-day -day needs. It also includes the expenditure made by the government to meet its regular needs. Such expenditure will not earn any revenue for the government in the future. So, revenue expenditure are basically termed as one-way payments. Also, expenditure incurred for the purpose of creation of physical or financial assets does not fall under the category of revenue expenditure. Now we will see some of the expenditure that falls under the ambit of revenue expenditure. First is payment of interest by the government. Second is expenditure toward law and order maintenance. Third is subsidies. Fourth is grant given by the central government to the state government. Fifth is pension and salary payments. And the last one is grant extended by the central government to the foreign government. So these are all the expenditure that falls under the revenue expenditure because these expenditure are one-way payment that does not earn revenue for the government in the future. Now moving on to capital expenditure. Capital expenditure includes those spending by the government which creates permanent assets. It includes both physical assets and financial assets. Capital expenditure also includes spending for the reduction in financial liabilities. Okay. So, basically, all expenditure made by the government that results in increasing asset of the government or reducing the liability of the government will come under capital expenditure. Now, let us see what are all the expenditure that falls under this category. First is the investment, like the investment in machinery, shares or infrastructure like roads, railways, ports, building, etc. It falls under capital expenditure. Second is loans. That is, loans extended by the central government to the state government or the loans extended by the state government to the local government falls under the capital expenditure category. But why? Because unlike grants, the loans extended by the government earns revenue for them through interest. So they are classified under capital expenditure. The last one is repayment of public debt. For example, if the government seeks to repay its loan it results in reduction in liability of the government. So, it also falls under the category of capital expenditure. Here you should note that high capital expenditure aids in economic growth because high capital expenditure means more investment by the government towards the creation of infrastructure and other assets that are crucial for the rapid economic growth. This is why the Tamil Nadu government's decision to increase its capital expenditure is seen as a positive move that will bring economic growth for the Tamil Nadu economy. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw the difference between revenue expenditure and capital expenditure. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this text and context article. The text and context article is talking about a new matter which is making rounds in the news. This is about the conjugal visits for prisoners. It is making headlines as recently Punjab became the first state in India to allow prisoners conjugal visits. Don't you want to know what it is? So, let us have a comprehensive discussion on this topic where we will be seeing its need, does India allow such visits or not, etc. Okay? So, before getting into the discussion, I have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Now, let us start by knowing the meaning of the term conjugal. Conjugal means relating to marriage or relationship between a married couple. You would have also often heard the terminology conjugal rights. It refers to the rights and privileges in a marriage or the rights and privileges among a married couple. 
so it includes intimate rights of marriage including mutual relationship of comfort companionship affection and even sexual relations then what is conjugal visits for prisoners you know who is a prisoner right any person who is confined in prison under the order of a competent authority is called a prisoner but does this confinement mean they have no rights actually no as per model prison manual 2016 it is the duty of the prison administration to ensure that prisoners human rights are respected not only that prison administration also endeavor to prepare prisoners to lead a reformed and socially rehabilitated life from this you would have got the clarity that prison is not only meant to fulfill the punishment of incarceration but also to reform and rehabilitate the individual on these same lines they also have some rights The All India Committee on Jail Reforms of 1980-83 has identified these rights. The committee is also called the Mulla Committee. Let us see the rights relevant to this discussion. Under the right to human dignity, prisoners have the right to non-deprivation of fundamental rights as guaranteed by the constitution. This will not apply to any law relating to confinement. Also, they have the right to communication. Under this, they have the right to communicate with the outside world and have the right to periodic interviews. Under this only, every person is given the right to see or communicate with their family members, relatives, friends and legal advisors. They are also allowed to have interviews with them once in a fortnight. But we have to remember one fact here. The prisoners we are referring are adults who have sexual desires too, which is a basic biological need. then how this is satisfied within the confinement of a prison this comes under the conjugal right am i right this also brings us to the question of does prisoners have conjugal rights we have to say yes because many of them will be married but to enjoy such right there should be conjugal visits that is the visits which will allow the prisoner to spend some time with their spouse in privacy but the condition is such a visit has to happen in the precinct of prison that is within the confinement of the prison now let us see why there is a need for such a visit firstly the conjugal visits in jail are said to fall under the fundamental right of the prisoners and their spouses even though many differ in this view secondly being convicted and imprisoned as a punishment for a crime does not remove the ties of marriage bond the convicted person and their spouse still remain married unless they get a divorce so they enjoy conjugal rights like normal couple but maybe with some conditions the third important reason is prisons enable aggressive sexual behavior in a urge to satisfy their sexual desires prisoners rape their fellow prisoners so this scenario needed a solution for which conjugal visits are suggested as one of the measure this suggestion is based on sexual gratification theory the theory postulates that conjugal visitation provides inmates with the means of sexual release and therefore it should reduce sexual offense in prisons see even some research complement the theory as their results show that permitting conjugal visits have significantly lowered the sexual offenses within prisons also such visits help the prisoners to keep their stress level in control thereby ensuring their smooth reentry into the society so all these factors demand the need for conjugal visits now you will wonder whether indian law permits it actually no as of now there is no provision in the law that allows for conjugal visits this is a result of lack of political will in this regard where the government and the authorities are opposing the conjugal visits they provide some valid reasons for the opposition of conjugal visits first one is the availability of parole and four law provision for prisoners both parole and four law are temporary release of the prisoner parole is guaranteed on the request of the prisoner and can be denied but four law is guaranteed to a prisoner who is in a long term imprisonment it is required to be granted immediately to the prisoner and it is considered as her right so during parole and four law the prisoner spends time with their family so the argument here is that parole and four law help in maintaining family and social ties and the conjugal relations and they will also help in the maintenance of the conjugal relations so since there is parole and four law in indian provision there is no separate need for the conjugal visits the second is there is no facility available in prison as per rules and there is also limited infrastructure to permit conjugal visits 
the third one is the government point out that conjugal visit might create security problems like smuggling of contraband goods from outside so if it happens what our positive effects is envisaged on the conjugal visits will be neutralized okay these are some of the reasons offered by the government for not moving forward with the idea of conjugal visits but does the judiciary share the same view actually no judicial verdicts have already provided this right let us see some of the important supreme court judgments in this regard first one is the 1980 case law which is nothing but the sunil batra versus delhi administration case and it is popularly known as the sunil batra 2 case this case liberated the jail inmates from the atrocities inflicted through the mental torture psychic and physical pressure it upheld prisoners right to invoke article 21 of the indian constitution and allowed liberal visits by family and friends then in the next year that is in 1981 another important verdict came in the case law francis coroli mulin was the administrator of union territory of delhi in this the supreme court expanded the expression personal liberty embedded in article 21 it held that the prisoners have the fundamental rights and other legal rights that is available to a free person also see these two verdicts have kept the prisoners on par with the normal individuals on many matters this definitely includes the conjugal rights too another case which directly dealt with the conjugal rights is the jaswir singh versus state of punjab 2014 case in this case the punjab and the haryana high court allowed conjugal visits and artificial insemination for inmates the court held that right to procreation survives incarceration this means even while in incarceration the prisoners have the right to procreate it held that such a right falls within the ambit of article 21 then in 2018 the madras high court allowed conjugal visits saying that conjugal visits were a right and not a privilege here they allowed a 40 year old convict to visit home for 2 weeks for the purpose of procreation so this shows the will of the judiciary in providing conjugal visits to prisoners on these lines only the punjab government has become the forerunner in providing conjugal visits in prisons it allows two hour visits for inmates to spend time alone with their legal spouse the punjab government is working on par with the international law on prisons see the united nations standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners recognizes conjugal visits according to rule 58 conjugal visits as a right shall be applied without discrimination and women prisoners also enjoy the same right also countries such as russia germany france belgium spain philippines canada saudi arabia and denmark allow conjugal visits from this it is clear that one of the countries that is known for its high capital punishment rate that is saudi is also providing this conjugal visit so a democratic country like india which values human rights should also consider incorporating conjugal visits in our prison system but considering the security issues such right could be made limited like how punjab has done yes conjugal rights are denied for certain category of convicts in punjab like high risk prisoners gangsters and terrorist additionally those having good conduct and discipline are given preference so like this conditions can be included in the law to provide right of conjugal visit for prisoners again i would like to reiterate that prison is not just for punishment but for the prisoners to reform and rehabilitate and a constant touch of a family member will ease the process of the rehabilitation so that's all regarding this discussion with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this article this article talks about cyclone mandas it is over bay of bengal and this cyclone is likely to hit the northern part of tamil nadu and puducherry coast this is about the news article given here in this context in our discussion today let us see why bay of bengal is more prone to tropical cyclones compared to arabian sea first of all what are tropical cyclones tropical cyclones are a low pressure system here air from high pressure area rushes to the low pressure area but the thing is that the air won't be able to reach the low pressure area due to coriolis force and coriolis force is an apparent force that a moving body experience due to the rotation of the earth now coming back as the air cannot reach the low pressure region it starts spiraling this is why in the northern hemisphere the tropical cyclones rotate in the anti clockwise direction and in the southern hemisphere the tropical cyclones rotate in the clockwise direction from what i have just said what can we infer 
we can infer that two things are necessary for the tropical cyclones one is the presence of low pressure system and the other is the presence of coriolis force here take the second part that is coriolis force as we know that along the equator the coriolis force is zero the tropical cyclones do not form near the equator okay with this basic idea let us try to find the answer for this question the question being why is bay of bengal more prone to tropical cyclones compared to arabian sea the first reason is that the bay of bengal gets intensely heated up in comparison to arabian sea this gives rise to low pressure zone and as we have already seen the low pressure zone helps in the formation of cyclone the second reason is the shape of bay of bengal look at this map you can see that bay of bengal is more concave in nature due to this strong winds can help the water pile up this piling up process aids in the formation of cyclone the third reason is the geography the tropical cyclones that form in the pacific ocean are called typhoon here if you notice there is no perfect land boundary between bay of bengal and pacific ocean so sometimes these typhoons that originate in the pacific ocean can travel up to the bay of bengal this is one of the reason why bay of bengal is more prone to tropical cyclones then the next reason is cyclones that originate in the bay of bengal loses its energy on reaching the arabian sea this is due to the large land mass that is present between bay of bengal and arabian sea so there is less cyclone in the arabian sea side the next reason is arabian sea lacks constant fresh water flow whereas if you take bay of bengal it gets constant fresh water flow from the rivers like ganga brahmaputra mahanadi krishna godavari kaveri everything this increases the surface temperature of the sea here you have to know that fresh water is less denser than the sea water so the fresh water brought by these rivers stay above the saline sea water due to the difference in salinity level these waters they don't mix very well since the waters are not mixing the sea surface temperature is not easily dissipated so compared to the arabian sea the sea surface temperature in bay of bengal is comparatively high and we know that the higher temperature aids in the formation of low pressure region and low pressure region in turn aids in the formation of cyclone this is one of the reason why bay of bengal is more prone to tropical cyclones the last reason is the post monsoon winds in the post monsoon period the wind blows in the northeastern direction so the low pressure system that exist in the bay of bengal are pushed towards the indian landmass so the eastern coast of india receives more cyclonic rainfall during the post monsoon period that is in the november to december period this is the reason why cyclone mandus is likely to hit the northern coast of tamil nadu and puducherry so this is the reason why there is more number of tropical cyclones in bay of bengal compared to arabian sea i hope this discussion was very useful with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article now take a look at this editorial article it talks about the regional organizations like sark and bimstech the author through this editorial advocates that bimstech as an intergovernmental organization must take steps to fill the void left out by sark in the south asian region this is the idea based on which the article is written in this context let us learn about both sark and bimstech and we will also see the issues affecting sark and the advantages offered by bimstech this is the plan for this discussion before getting into the discussion i have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion you can go through it first let us see about the term south asia south asia refers to a region comprising of countries like afghanistan pakistan india bangladesh nepal bhutan sri lanka and maldives here keep in mind whenever i use the term south asia i refer to the countries that is mentioned here now with this information let us start our discussion first let us take up sark sark stands for south asian association for regional cooperation sark as a regional organization came into existence in the year 1985 it was established after the signing of the sark charter by the member countries in dhaka in 1985 now coming to the member states sark comprises of eight member states they are afghanistan bangladesh bhutan india maldives nepal pakistan and sri lanka so all the south asian region countries are members of sark and the secretariat of the association is located in kathmandu nepal now let us see the objectives of sark the objectives of the association are highlighted in the sark charter itself 
the first one is to promote welfare of the people of south asia and to improve their quality of life second is to accelerate economic growth social progress and cultural development in the region and also to provide opportunity to all individuals in the region to live a life with dignity and to realize their full potential now moving on to the next objective the next objective is to promote and strengthen collective self reliance among the countries of the south asia finally sarc also tries to contribute to mutual trust understanding and ap- appreciation of one another's problem it also tries to promote active collaboration and mutual assistance in the economic social cultural technical and scientific fields these are all the objectives of sarc in sarc decisions at all level are to be taken on the basis of unanimity this is what the article also talks about pakistan in the past has followed a obstructionist philosophy with regard to sarc and this has led to the sarc moving into disuse further bilateral and contentious issues are excluded from the deliberations of the association okay now coming to the decision making authority of sarc here note that the meetings of the head of the state or government of the member states is the highest decision making authority in sarc so these are all about sarc here we saw about the member countries the objectives of sarc how the decisions are taken in sarc and what is the highest decision making authority in sarc moving on we will see about the bimstec first what is this bimstec bimstec is nothing but an acronym for the bay of bengal initiative for multisectoral technical and economic cooperation bimstec as a regional organization came into existence on 6th june 1997 through the bangkok declaration it comprises of seven member states that are lying in the littoral and adjacent areas of bay of bengal and it constitutes a contiguous regional unity here littoral means a region lying along a shore you can see in this map the seven member countries of the bimstec of these member countries five are from the south asian region they are bangladesh bhutan india nepal and sri lanka and two are from the southeast asian region they are myanmar and thailand the objectives of bimstec is given here in the table with the list of countries looking over the objectives see here india looks after the security of the region and additionally it also looks after the domains of disaster management and energy this table has potential prelims questions so kindly make note of the pairs given in the table so this is about the basic about bimstec now let us see the issues present in sarc the first issue is the trust deficit between india and pakistan due to strained bilateral relations due to this trust deficit decisions requiring unanimity are not made possible under sarc the second major issue affecting sarc is the fear of dominance of smaller countries by larger countries in the grouping this is particularly true in the case of maldives and nepal and they are misbelieving that india would use its military and economic power in their internal matters which makes the integration of the countries under sarc very difficult and finally sarc meetings have stopped happening from 2014 onwards without any meeting no conclusive decisions involving the member countries could be taken so these are the major problems associated with sarc moving on let us see the advantages of bimstec the first thing is that bimstec's charter is better than sarc charter this is due to the fact that bimstec charter in its article 6 talks about the admission of new members to the group this provision allows for the expansion of the grouping in the future if the need arises secondly bimstec can act as a link between south and southeast asia this is made possible because of the nature of the bimstec itself as we saw bimstec has members from both south and south asia region so bimstec can act as a link between south and south asia this is the second advantage the third and the major advantage is that through bimstec india can ensure trade integration with the countries present in the southeast asian region see right now india has no free trade agreement with the countries of the asian grouping but through bimstec india can promote trade with thailand and myanmar which are part of the asian grouping so indirectly india can integrate its trade link with the asian countries okay so these are all the advantages of bimstec now finally let us move on to the important question can bimstec replace sarc actually the author of this editorial is of the opinion that bimstec must take steps to replace sarc 
he says that by enhancing trade and economic integration among the members of the bimstech bimstech can actually replace sark in the future but according to my opinion we have to wait and watch only in the future if the need arises india can completely neglect sark and integrate with the bimstech countries so that's all about this discussion in this discussion first we started by seeing about sar then we saw some basic points about bimstech after that we saw the issues that are associated with sark and after that we saw the advantages associated with bimstech finally we saw can bimstech replace sark so that's all regarding this discussion with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this article the article says that vice president has raised the issue of judicial incursion into the legislative domain here the vice president was referring to the national judicial appointments commission and the supreme court judgment in the supreme court advocates on records association west union of india case which is famously known as the fourth judges case the vice president said that by invalidating the 99th constitutional amendment act and the national judicial appointments commission through the fourth judges case the judiciary was violating the principle of separation of powers and entered into the domain of the legislature he also said why the parliament was silent when the supreme court nullified the national judicial appointments commission this is about the news article given here in this context let us discuss about the role of the vice president as the chairman of rajya sabha first let us take article 63 of the indian constitution it provides that there shall be a vice president of india then in article 63 and in article 891 it is said that the vice president of india shall be the ex officio chairman of the council of states that is the rajya sabha you know what is unique about the office of vice president in our constitutional setup the vice president is part of the executive but as a chairman of the rajya sabha the vice president is part of the legislature also so the vice president has a dual capacity and holds two distinct and separate offices okay with this basic understanding now let us see about the role of vice president as the chairman of rajya sabha firstly the chairman presides over the meetings of rajya sabha secondly the chairman is the guardian of the prestige and dignity of the house okay thirdly the chairman is also the principal spokesman of the house and he represents the collective voice of the house to the outside world fourthly the chairman ensures that the proceedings of the house are conducted in accordance with the relevant constitutional provisions rules practices and convention also the vice president or the chairman ensures that the decorum is maintained in the house then the chairman is the custodian and guardian of the rights and privileges of the house and the members of the house the next role is that even though the chairman might be busy as he is also the vice president the chairman makes sure that he presides during the first hour of the sitting of the house which is nothing but the question hour because it is during this time period the accountability of the government is ensured so the chairman takes the responsibility to ensure the members rights of asking questions and receiving complete replies from the present day government then the chairman gives rulings on privilege matters and other procedural points while talking about the powers and functions of the chairman you have to know this point the chairman like the speaker cannot vote in the first instance only when there is a tie the chairman gets the power of voting this is according to article 100 this is what is called as casting vote okay then the chairman's rulings are considered as precedents which are of binding nature due to this the chairman is not bound to give any reasons for his decision also the chairman's rulings cannot be questioned or criticized and you have to note here that to protest against the ruling of the chairman is a contempt of the house okay finally you have to know that the chairman is assisted by the deputy chairman who is the member of the rajya sabha and he is elected by it okay also note that the deputy chairman presides over the rajya sabha in absence of the chairman and he also performs the duties of the office of the chairman if the vice president is acting as a president or if there is a vacancy in the office of vice president finally there is the secretariat of rajya sabha which is headed by a secretary general the secretariat of rajya sabha helps in assisting the chairman in discharge of his duties 
So these are all the powers and functions of the vice president while he is acting as the chairman of Rajya Sabha. So with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article here. As per the article, Russian President Vladimir Putin described Russia's nuclear arsenals as an deterrent force in the Ukrainian conflict. But at the same time, he objected when asked to make a pledge that Russia will not be the first to use them. For this, Mr. Putin replied that such an obligation might prevent Russia from tapping its nuclear arsenal. This is about the news article given here. In this context, we will understand about the no first use policy and about India's nuclear doctrine. Before getting into the discussion, I have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Now let us start our discussion by understanding what is a no first use policy. No first use policy is a commitment. It is a commitment to never use the nuclear weapon first under any circumstances. So if you make this commitment, you should not use nuclear weapons as a preemptive attack or first strike. And you should not use nuclear weapons first in response to non-nuclear attack of any kind. And this is only no first use policy. Now you may think if they are not going to use it, then why bother building a nuclear weapon? No first use policy simply means that countries that have committed to this policy will not use nuclear weapons in the first instance. But if the other country uses nuclear weapon on them, at that time they can retaliate using nuclear weapons. So this is the reason why countries even though after committing to no first use policy have developed nuclear arsenal. This no first use policy is generally declaratory in nature. There is no diplomatic arrangement to verify and enforce it. Those countries that have pledged can still use nuclear weapons first in a conflict. And this is also the reason why countries develop nuclear weapons. Now with this information, let us see who all have adhered to the no first use policy. As of now, 9 countries worldwide possess nuclear weapons. They are United States, Russia, France, China, United Kingdom, Pakistan, India, Israel and North Korea. Out of this, China and India are the nuclear armed country that have no first use policy. And you have to know that India maintains the policy of no first use with exception. Those exceptions are for a response to chemical or biological attacks. Apart from this, the other countries such as France, North Korea, Pakistan, Russia, the United Kingdom and the United States, they maintain the policies that permit the first use of nuclear weapons in a conflict. So this is about the commitment to no first use policy by the nuclear powered countries. With this information, let us see about the India's nuclear doctrine. Firstly, India's nuclear doctrine tries to build and maintain a credible minimum deterrent of nuclear weapons. Secondly, nuclear weapons will be used only in retaliation against nuclear attack on Indian territory or on an Indian force anywhere. Thirdly, India's nuclear doctrine says that nuclear retaliation to a first strike will be massive and it will be designed to cause unacceptable damage. Fourthly, nuclear retaliatory attacks can be authorized by the civil political leadership through the nuclear command authority. Fifthly, there will be no use of nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states. However, in the event of major attack against India by biological or chemical weapons, India will retain the option of retaliating using nuclear weapons. Then, India will continue to follow strict controls on export of nuclear and missile related material and technology. It will participate in the fissile material cutoff treaty negotiations and it will continue to follow the prohibition on nuclear test. Finally, India's nuclear doctrine says that India will continue to commit to the goal of nuclear weapon free world. This commitment should be fulfilled through the global, verifiable and non-discriminatory nuclear disarmament. So this is about the India's nuclear doctrine. With these points, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Have a look at this editorial. It talks about the issue of crimes against foreign tourists visiting India. The author mentions about some of the examples of the untoward incidents involving foreign tourists which happened in India. He also presents numerous data to conclude that crimes against foreign tourists have been declining in India. Even though declining, the crimes against foreigners visiting India could dent our image globally which will have an effect on the inflow of foreign tourists. To take a hold of this situation, Ministry of Tourism in collaboration with the Bureau of Police Research and Development that is BPRD organized a conference in Delhi on October 19, 2022. 
this is about the editorial given here in this context let us learn about the national conference on tourist police firstly note that public order and police are subjects which are under the state list under schedule 7 of the indian constitution with this important point in mind let us see about the conference the national conference on tourist police scheme has been coordinated by the ministry of tourism the meeting was convened to discuss the best practices of tourist policing in india and coordinate further efforts in this regard it was suggested that the tourist police should be in the control of the state government like general police however it was held that ministry of tourism can provide financial assistance to the state government for effective implementation of the tourist police scheme the idea of the conference was to develop a dedicated team of police personnel by the state and the union territory to work towards safeguarding tourists and providing them with security having seen this now let us see the objective of this conference the objective of the national conference on tourist police scheme is to bring ministry of tourism ministry of home affairs bprd and the state and the union territory administration on the same platform when they are brought into the same platform it will enable them to work together in close coordination to suit the specific requirements of the foreign tourist for the effective implementation of the uniform tourist policy scheme at the pan india level this would change the safety and security related perception of india at the global level and it will also help in making india a must visit destination around the globe the template for functioning of the tourist police in states and union territories are deliberated in the meeting the discussed template specifically deals with firstly preparation of a standard operating procedure to be followed by the tourist police in states and union territories secondly development of a training program for tourist police and finally suggestion for the uniform of tourist police so that's all about the national conference on tourist police which recently happened in the month of october in new delhi so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this article the news here is that big industries do not follow the labor standards in india this was said by the representatives of the workers union and it was said at the ongoing asia and the pacific regional meeting of the international labor organization this is about the news article given here in this context let us discuss about the international labor organization or ilo in detail the ilo is the only tripartite un agency and it is operating since 1990 it brings together governments employers and workers of 187 member states this is to set labor standards develop policies and devise programs promoting decent work for all women and men now let us see the history behind the establishment of ilo ilo was established in the year 1919 by the treaty of versailles it was established as an affiliated agency of the league of nation and it became the first affiliated specialized agency of the united nation in 1946 okay and the headquarters of ilo is located in geneva switzerland the basis of the ilo is the tripartite principle that is the negotiation within the organization are held between the representatives of government trade union and the employers from the member states now moving on to the organizational structure of the ilo the ilo accomplishes its work through three main bodies they are international labor conference governing body and the international labor office all the three bodies here comprises of governments employers and worker representatives in this the international labor conference sets the international labor standards and the broad principles of the ilo it meets annually in geneva it is often referred to as the international parliament of labor moving on to the next body which is the governing body it is the executive council of the ilo it meets three times in a year in geneva and it takes policy decisions of the ilo and establishes the program and budget of the ilo then after establishing the programs and the budget it submits the program and budget to the international labor conference for approval the last major body is the international labor office it is the permanent secretariat of the ilo and it is the focal point of the ilo's overall activities the international labor office has a director general and the labor office is scrutinized by the governing body of the ilo then there are the regional meetings here the ilo member states come together periodically to examine matters of special interest to the region concerned 
So this is about the organizational structure of ILO. Now moving on, let us see about the objectives of ILO. The first objective is to promote and realize standards and fundamental principles and rights to workers. The second objective is to create greater opportunities for women and men to secure decent employment. The third one is to enhance the coverage and effectiveness of social protection for all. Then the next objective is to strengthen tripartism and social dialogue. Here, tripartism means the government, the unions and the employers must come together and ensure that there is a dialogue among the three stakeholders. Okay. Now, moving on, finally, let us see the functions of ILO. Firstly, it creates coordinated principles and programs. These programs are directed at solving the social and the labor issues. Secondly, ILO ensures the adoption of international labor standards. This is done in the form of conventions and recommendations and control over their implementation. Then, when the ILO convention is ratified, a member state accepts it as a legally binding instrument. Okay. Thirdly, ILO assists the member states in solving social and labor related problems. Fourthly, ILO ensures the protection of human rights like the right to work, freedom of association, collective negotiation, protection against forced labor and protection against discrimination. Finally, ILO does research and publishes work on the social and labor issues. So these are the major functions performed by ILO. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we covered the international labor organization holistically and I think we have not left any points behind. So note the points that we discussed here. It will be very helpful for your examination. So with this, let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions. We have four practice prelims questions. Let us see them one by one. Let us take up the first question. This question is in regards to tourist police scheme. Two statements are given. We have to find the correct statement. Let us take up the first statement. Under the scheme, a pool of trained policemen would be made available to render policing service to the tourist and would control the crimes at the place of the tourist interest. See, this statement is correct because it is one of the major objective of the tourist police scheme. Moving on to the second statement, this scheme will be implemented by the Union Ministry of Home Affairs to maintain uniformity. See, this statement is wrong because we saw that policing comes under the state list of the Schedule 7 of the Constitution. So, statement 2 is wrong. Since statement 1 is only correct, the correct answer here is option A, 1 only. Moving on to the second question, See, it is a map-based question. Five countries are given. We have to find the countries that are bordering Arabian Sea. Now look at this map. From this map, you can say that Pakistan, India, Yemen, Oman and Iran have borders with Arabian Sea. And Iraq does not have a border with Arabian Sea. So the correct answer here is option A, 1, 2, 3 and 4 only. Moving on to the third question. See here, four conventions of international labor organization are given and we have to find which among the convention India has ratified. Okay. See, there are eight conventions of ILO. In that, India has ratified six. The convention that India has ratified are forced labor convention, abolition of forced labor convention, equal remuneration convention, discrimination, employment, occupation convention, minimum age convention and worst forms of child labor convention. And India has not ratified two conventions. The convention are freedom of association and protection of right to organize convention and right to organize and collective bargain convention. Here you can note that the third statement that is freedom of association and protection of right to organize convention for this India has not ratified. So the correct answer for this question is option D 1, 2 and 4. Now look at this question. This is a quiz question for you today. This question can be easily answered if you have closely listened to our first discussion. That is discussion on revenue expenditure and capital expenditure. Interested aspirants can post the answer for this question in the comment section. The main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answers and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.